Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. It's been a while since I've posted any videos and the reason for that is that I've got myself a new job and getting up to speed on that has taken quite a long time. Also I've done some writing for Cycling Weekly which means a lot of the ideas that I had for videos have ended up being printed in Cycling Weekly and this is one of them. So I was really really fortunate to hook up with uh, Anna Kiesenhofer after her Olympic road race victory to talk to her about two things. First, about uh, the dealing with the heat of uh, Tokyo and how she went about that. But then subsequently, I got to talk to her about fatigue resistance. Now, fatigue resistance is not a new thing. In fact, it's quite an old thing. But in the context of endurance physiology, there's been a resurgence of interest in the notion of fatigue resistance as perhaps the fourth endurance parameter following vo2 max lactate threshold and running economy or cycling efficiency and fatigue resistance is thought to be the fourth endurance parameter because it dictates how you manage to deal with large volumes of exercise and the effect that that then has on your, your endurance performance capabilities and on your endurance performance parameters and we'll deal with that a little bit later but first of all let's just think about what anna kiesenhofer actually did in the women's road race. Now the women's road race was special for a number of reasons and one of those was that there were no radios in that race and so the peloton were completely unable to monitor what was happening ahead of them and that led to some real problems tactically particularly by the favourites the Dutch riders. And so what actually happened was in the early phase of the race the uh, peloton breezed along completely uh, unconcerned by the breakaway and the breakaway contained Anna Kiesenhofer and a number of other riders and they gained almost 10 minutes on the peloton at the uh, the middle of the mid portion of the race and with about 40 kilometers to go Anna noticed that her uh, partners in crime if you like were starting to take fewer turns on the front and weren't really pulling the way they should have been and so she decided to attack and attack she did off with about 40 kilometers to go and she sustained that attack all the way to the finish and won an historic gold medal. So it was one of the most astonishing performances I've ever seen from a lone breakaway rider in a championship race. And it will probably never happen again because people are now wise to the so-called doing a Kiesenhofer. But in chatting to Anna, there were a number of interesting things that she raised about her performance in the race. And I mentioned these in the Cycling Weekly article, which is... Uh, now off print so you might be able to find that online but I'm basically going to say what I said in that piece and Anna's thoughts about how she did the race were of interest to me so first of all in the early phases of the race when she was building the breakaway with the other riders she actually felt really controlled it didn't hurt more like tempo riding and trying to stay on top of nutrition and hydration in other words Anna was effectively working in the moderate intensity domain in zone one if you want to call it that and really not putting herself into any real difficulty at all it's just that the peloton was going slower than uh, she and her compatriots were then she attacked and she says when i attacked my breakaway group i was feeling really good and could have done a vo2 max interval at that point so i was feeling really fresh and anna you must know is so precise in her language that even when she speaks there is a rate dot above the v and the two and the max of vo2 max are subscripted brilliant and then in the last hour or so in the last half hour she said she was feeling really low on glycogen at least that's what she was feeling and she also mentioned that she no longer had command of her legs and felt the neuromuscular pattern starting to change my body was trying to use whatever fibers were still there and that's really interesting. We've all kind of, if we've done any um, heavy cycling, whether that's in the lab or in competition, we often get to that point of pedaling squares. And it's interesting to see an Olympic champion experiences much the same thing. But what is this fatigue all about? Um, well, I don't want to go in deeply into fatigue mechanisms per se. I just want to pick up on, on what Anna was doing. But we need to really define what we're talking about. And that's not easy. So there are a huge number of definitions of fatigue. Uh, 
And it's important, I've mentioned this before, but you must differentiate fatigue and exhaustion or task failure because they're not synonymous. So task failure is an event, whereas fatigue is the process that can lead to that event or lead to exhaustion, if you like. Then there's how you define exercise-induced fatigue or neuromuscular fatigue, as we might call it. You could call it intensive activity of the muscles that causes a decline in performance, and that's rather vague. You could call it the decline in the ability to produce force or exert force. That's a fair definition if you're only doing isometric exercise. Fatigue is reflected in EMG as an increase in amplitude and reduction in spectral frequency. Well, then you need some EMG recording equipment to pick that up. It doesn't really tell you much about muscular performance. A couple of others. A conscious awareness of changes in subconscious homeostatic control. So a central governor related uh, definition of fatigue there. And then Taylor and Gandivia, quite a tidy definition. Any exercise induced decrease in maximal voluntary force or power produced by a muscle or muscle group. And finally, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute in 1990 defined fatigue in this way. A loss in the capacity developing force and or velocity of a muscle resulting from muscle activity under load and which is reversible by rest. And I think that's Although it's, there's a lot to unpack there, I think that's one of the best definitions of fatigue, or at least neuromuscular fatigue, I've ever seen. And it's the reversible by rest part that's important because that differentiates it from eccentric muscle damage, for example. It's important to note that fatigue can occur at any intensity of exercise provided you do that exercise for long enough. So even in the moderate domain, the heavy domain, the severe and extreme domain, you will experience fatigue, although that fatigue will be different. Now, fatigue is most obvious to see in the severe and extreme domains because it happens in a matter of seconds to minutes because you're exercising in the non-steady state and it is by definition unsustainable. However, you can also experience fatigue in the heavy domain and in the moderate domain if exercise is prolonged for several hours in the case of moderate intensity exercise below lactate threshold. Heavy intensity exercise, of course, between lactate threshold and critical power. Now, we tried to characterize this many moons ago, myself and Andy Jones, when we drew up this table, looking at the physiological responses, in this particular case, the VO2 kinetic responses to exercise, the, en the endurance time, how long you can sustain that exercise for, and the likely fatigue mechanisms. And I'm not going to go into huge detail about this table because you can actually read this paper online. I'll put a link in the description. Um, it is free to read. But what Anna was talking about and what Anna was experiencing is exercise in the heavy intensity domain, possibly slipping into the severe domain towards the end of her effort. But it's this, glycogen depletion and hypothermia would have been the major players in her effort. And so we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail because it does significantly affect uh, fatigue resistance. So then the question is, what on earth is fatigue resistance? Well, it's an old concept. In fact, it's a very old concept. Because in the 1960s, fatigue resistance was often used to describe the uh, muscle fibre characteristics when you were looking at fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibres. So you could have a slow twitch muscle that was fatigue resistant, which is given the symbol FR, sorry, SR, you could have a fast twitch but fatigue resistance fiber, which was given FR, and then a fast twitch fatigable fiber, which was given the symbol FF. We now know that SR fibers are type 1 fibers, FR fibers are type 2A fibers, and FF fibers are your type 2X fibers, what you should be called, if you look at the literature in the 1980s and 1990s, they were called type 2B fibers. They've now been reclassified as type 2X. The first reference in whole body human performance to fatigue resistance came in a study of black versus white runners and the data from that is shown in those two graphs uh, to the side there. So what, they, what these uh, authors, these are from Tim Noakes's lab, suggested was that black runners demonstrated greater fatigue resistance in uh, exercise uh, durations longer than 5 kilometers. So races longer than 5k black runners demonstrated superior fatigue resistance to 
um, white runners. So they essentially looked at two high performance groups and that's what they concluded. And you can see that play out here on the top graph that as the duration of uh, the or the, the length of the races increases then the difference between the black runners given by the black symbols and the white runners given by the white symbols that increases. So middle distance is really not a lot of difference between them and then the fatigue resistance of the black athletes is greater. Now that's one way of looking at that but I think the modern interpretation of that would be that the superior fatigue resistance of the black running group was actually due to the fact that they had a higher critical speed and so essentially what's not happened in this study is they haven't had runners matched for critical speed and so they're not really measuring what we would look at as fatigue resistance today because you'd have to have the same starting point in terms of those aerobic parameters. And so two more recent definitions of fatigue resistance are the ability to minimize fatigue development at any given exercise intensity or perhaps more interestingly the ability to pre prevent falls in key endurance parameters such as critical power or critical speed. So you're looking at changes in the power duration relationship over time. Here's one example of the first of those definitions and this is from Ducroc et al. in 2021. You find that in Medicine, Science and Sports and Exercise. And what they showed was that during time trials of one minute or ten minutes duration, pro riders experienced less fatigue than moderately trained riders. In other words, the pro riders had greater fatigue resistance because for the same duration and the same relative effort, they were fatiguing less. So they had less peripheral fatigue, as you can see from the uh, QT data down here. They had less overall fatigue, global fatigue you might call it in terms of the MVC drop. Um, and they also showed uh, relatively less fatigue in terms of a reduction in voluntary activation. So, and that was particularly the case for the more prolonged time trial. And 10 minutes isn't particularly prolonged, but both of these would be in the severe intensity domain and the pro riders outperformed or, or pr produced less fatigue than the moderate uh, moderately trained riders. That's very interesting. We also see the uh, fatigue resistance play out in the breaking two attempt. So all three runners in breaking two uh, experienced fatigue and we know that because the runners dropped off over time and not only that we also know that uh, Eliud Kipchoge was on course to break the two-hour barrier and it was only in the last uh, five kilometers or so did fatigue actually catch up with him and it's now thought that the major um, driver in breaking to eventually using the Ineos uh, approach one of the things that actually helped him there was he had better fatigue resistance because he'd learnt where his limits were in the case of the breaking two attempt and he used that knowledge to um, excel himself in the Ineos event. And one of the reasons we think that's the case is that we also know what happens when you do prolonged heavy exercise. So in prolonged heavy exercise the fatigue resistance or lack of it plays out in a reduction in the critical power and the curvature constant W prime. So these are data from Clark et al from uh, 2018 and you can see that there is a 24 watt reduction in the critical power measured using a three minute all out test so that's why it says end test power there and also about a 20 percent reduction in the W prime or the work done above the end test power in this particular case. Now of course if you're doing two hours of prolonged exercise you can't do a standard um, critical power measurement using the uh, conventional techniques of time to exhaustion uh, for the simple reason you'd have to do four or five uh, two hour bouts of um, exercise in order to be able to measure that change so it's much easier as it, well as easy as a three minute all out test can be to do a three minute all out test before and a three minute all out test after and then you can measure the change in those parameters in three minutes rather than over four tests and four lab visits. So a really nice piece of work to demonstrate how fatigue resistance really plays out or how fatigue affects these endurance parameters. And that's also been extended to look at this in the context of uh, a uh, 
prolonged uh, bout of exercise or, pro- or a series of bouts of exercise uh, in both professional and under 23 riders. These are data from Peter Leo and colleagues recently published. And what they showed was in accumulating a certain amount of work, you can see that the under 23 riders demonstrate a bigger drop off in performance than do the professional riders. And this seems to be the case also for uh, riders producing efforts like this during a grand tour that the GC riders, the general classification riders, tend to suffer the least drop-off, whereas the domestiques suffer the greatest, possibly because the domestiques burn themselves to um, service their, their grand tour uh, or the GC contenders, the general classification contenders. So there's a little bit of um, rider tactics at play here, but quite clearly under 23 riders are doing the same kind of thing as professional riders suffer a greater degree of fatigue and therefore professional riders appear to be more fatigue resistant. How do you promote fatigue resistance? Well there's a number of ways of doing it. The first way of doing it is to do some decent training. So here we see a classic shift in the lactate curve as a result of training and you can see it uh, a rightward and downward shift that effectively raises the lactate threshold, raises the lactate turn point or the critical speed in this case. And as a result, you're able to produce more work for a given level of fatigue. Then there's pacing. So here's some data from um, Ross Tucker's laboratory looking at various different uh, running speeds. And you can see that there are characteristic pacing profiles for middle distance running. And then for distance running, you get this kind of uh, finishing kick something that people erroneously call the end spurt but what's happening here of course is that runners are choosing to husband their reserves as they run greater distances and so for running 10,000 meters they obviously pace it at a slower pace than they would uh, the 5,000 meters so or the mile in this particular case you see here similar pattern but at a different speed so by regulating your speed you can resist fatigue to a greater degree but of course you want to maximize your speed and minimize the degree of fatigue that you experience and that comes back to training and the other thing you can do is recover so if you're training hard concentrating on sleep on nutrition and recovery is also really really important and on the subject of nutrition we have these really interesting data again from uh, Andy Jones's laboratory um, on Aida Clark And what they show here is that if you ingest carbohydrate during performance, you can actually maintain critical power using uh, estimated using three minute all out test better than if you don't ingest uh, carbohydrates. Here we have the critical power at the start of the test. This is critical power after two hours of exercise without carbohydrates so using a placebo drink. And this is the critical power after two hours with carbohydrate. You can see it's better maintained and not significantly different from the initial value. So keeping on top of your nutrition is absolutely critical during races in the heavy intensity domain, just like those that Anna did. And one of the reasons Anna feels she may have actually started to suffer towards the end of the race is that she didn't take quite as much nutrition on in that last hour quite as much carbohydrate on in the last hour as she perhaps should have done. She only had the one bottle. She should have swapped out and got another one. And so where does this all leave us? Well, fatigue, neuromuscular fatigue, is a loss of maximal power or force, which is reversible by rest. Fatigue resistance is a slightly different concept. It's the ability to prevent the loss of sustainable power. So that's broadly what fatigue resistance is really all about. And fatigue resistance can be promoted by doing the basics well. So training, pacing, feeding, and recovery. And that, in a nutshell, is fatigue resistance. So all it remains for me to say is thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time.